Good, af Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's always hell trying to get the attention of career services people. Okay. <laughs> good afternoon and welcome back. Uh, my name is Tom Devlin. I'm from University of California, Berkeley, and I'm a member of the Advocacy Committee. Um, our next topic is immigration. And this is a topic that potentially has a potential dramatic impact on how we deliver career services to international students and how employers hire our graduates. Today we have two very competent individuals that happen to be lawyers, but they have a lot to offer, okay? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, um, Amy Scott from the Association of American Universities and Heather Stewart from NASFA, the Association of International Educators. First, Amy will share a few, few remarks with us, and then Heather, and then we will open up for Q&A. But let me tell you a little bit about Amy. Amy is the Associate Vice President for Federal Relations for the Association of American Universities, and in her role, she's the lead staff person relating to budget and appropriations for NAS NASA, as well as the National Science Foundation. In addition, she staffs issues related to visa and immigration policy, as well as export controls. Heather is currently the counsel and the director of immigration and public policy for NASA. She previously had a role in terms of government relations counsel at the American Council on International Personnel and liaison associate with the American Immigration Lawyer Association. She's a member of the DC Bar, as well as the American Immigration Lawyers Association. So first we'll have Amy, um, Amy speak, and then he Heather. And I'd like to have us welcome them very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the warm introduction and warm reception is much appreciated. Um, and thanks to Ellen Smith for inviting me. She and I have been longtime colleagues in uh, the university world. Um, so for today's discussion, I'm going to hopefully give a snapshot um, of the politics surrounding immigration reform. And it certainly has been a bumpy road for, oh, I say the last 10 plus years really, Heather and I have been in, in the trenches, so to speak, on immigration reform for that amount of time, literally. Um, so I actually, it's, it's actually perfect timing that I'm here today, we're here today having this conversation because just yesterday, the House Republican leadership released their standards for immigration reform. Um, as you all probably have heard in the news, uh, the House Republicans are meeting on the Eastern Shore of Maryland going for their annual retreat. And uh, yesterday, they had a very comprehensive conversation about immigration reform and what direction the party and, i.e., the House uh, le Republican leadership will be going over the next uh, few months and maybe even year. Uh, so again, to the standards for immigration reform, um, I guess it's no surprise um, that they released um, the standards when they did. Uh, immigration obviously has been a topic of a conversation, uh, will be obviously a topic of a conversation for the 2014 midterm elections as well as the 2016 uh, presidential elections. So I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at the standards themselves. Uh, they're about a page and a half long, um, but even though they're relatively short, I think they cover a lot of substantive topics. Uh, the first topic that is actually listed in the uh, immigration reform uh, standards is border security. And again, this is not a surprise because the House leadership as well as uh, Republicans in general, in, in general in the House have been talking a lot about uh, border security. And essentially the standard is we're not going to do anything on immigration reform until we secure our borders. The northern and southern border, um, obviously, is, is, is a key focus. Um, it also says we're not going to do anything until we have ensured that the nation's immigration laws are being fully enforced. So those are two significant caveats for action. Um, the next 
important point in the standard is, standards is legalization. And again, the topic of conversation has been how do we address or how do we deal with the legalization of the, those who are currently undocumented and residing in the United States. And there's about roughly 11.5 million undocumented individuals in the United States, as we all know. So the document is rather prescriptive. Um, the first thing it says is there will be no special pathway to citizenship for those who are currently undocumented and, and residing in the United States. And by that, it means no citizenship. We're going to legalize them. They will be able to legally reside in the country, but the step towards citizenship will not be addressed. Um, not quite sure what that means. Does that mean in future legislation they'll address citizenship? Or does that mean they will never address citizenship? Um, so that is a huge, huge uh, caveat. It also says, in terms of legalization, that in order for an undocumented individual to legally reside in the United States, they will have to do the following. First, they would have to admit their culpability for obviously coming into the United States illegally. Uh, two, pass rigorous background checks. Three, pay significant fines and back taxes. Four, develop proficiency in English and American civics. And finally, five, um, be able to financially support themselves and their families without public assistance. Again, very prescriptive. Um, the next important standard I think um, is important to, um, to raise is um, the things that I think we I think really care about or really maybe are more significant for the purposes of this conversation. Um, not surprisingly, there's a, a mention of electronic employment verification and making sure that those who are in the country and working in the country are uh, legally able to do so. Uh, this is, again, I say not a surprise because for a number of years, both Republicans and Democrats have been talking about the mandatory usage of the E-Verify system, which is currently now a voluntary system and currently, I think several, maybe 100,000 or so employers use, utilize E-Verify. Um, again, this, is a, this standard is meant to uh, prompt or require mandatory usage by all employers. So it's definitely something, if there is a bill that comes down the pike with respect to an immigration reform, and it does include E-Verify e or some sort of electronic verification system, I think it, it's important to look at the details of, of that provision for sure. Um, again, for the purposes of this conversation, I'll just turn a little bit to the student aspect of things. Um, there is, again, no surprise uh, mention of uh, uh, DREAM Act students. So these are students who are brought to the United States when they were younger, at a young age, uh, have lived in the United States for most of their lives, you know, don't know their home country, don't remember their home country. Uh, these are also students who either obviously have graduated or are attending one of our universities or um, have, you know, served in the military. Um, it's interesting how the, the, the principles or the standards, I say, treat these students because, again, there's a recognition, I think, now amongst House Republicans and I think generally everyone in, in Congress that these students are important and these students deserve um, not only legalization, not only to be legalized, to legally reside in the United States, but also to be on the pathway, be put on the pathway to citizenship. So this is um, definitely an important point. Uh, again, it's all the, the devil's in the details. And again, if there's a bill that comes out of this whole, uh, these standards, then it'd be interesting to kind of see really what that looks like. Um, I think it's also important to note, and I know Heather's going to talk about this a little bit, but it's important to note that the, the Senate bill that was passed this summer uh, really do, does some really good things for DREAM Act students. So hopefully, again, if we see a House bill, it will likewise do some good things for DREAM Act students. Um, the next thing I'll, I'll mention is um, it, it, there's language in the bill that addresses high-skilled immigration reform. I mean, I think there's a recognition of the importance of folks who are, you know, students who are educated at our universities and colleges. These are the, you know, the best and brightest international students who are coming to the U.S. to um, either get a bachelor's degree or, or, or a master's or higher degree, and that these are valuable people to 
uh, you know, either not just educate, but hopefully if they want to stay in the country, um, to keep them in the country if they want to stay here. And so there is a recognition of that and those, those people in this document and the, the importance of figuring out a way that we can uh, improve the visa system and the green card system so that it's easier for, for these individuals to um, come, get educated, and if they would like to stay, stay in the United States. Um, again, the devil's in the details. We'll see what that looks like. Um, and I will also say that a few months ago, the House Judiciary Committee passed the Skills Visa Act, which, again, goes to more high-skilled immigration reform. And it will also, it'll be very interesting to see if, in the, at the end of the day, the, um, they actually move that bill to the floor, House floor or what they do with that. But it's, I think it's important to recognize that um, the folks that we're educating are, are, are recognized as important um, people to, um, again, educate and hopefully retain in the United States if they want to, so they can help the American economy and be contributors to our, our local communities. So that's kind of a, a snapshot of, of the, the immigration standards that the House GOP laid out yesterday. Um, moving on to the politics surrounding that and what does that mean uh, for, for us moving forward. I, I, I think this, the, the, my immediate, immediate thought is, well, I'm not sure what that means for us moving forward. Um, I think a lot depends on the rank and file membership, the rank and file Republican membership and their reaction to these principles. I will tell you that the principles were, were released yesterday at 4.30 or 5 o'clock. Uh, the rank and file membership had a chance to look at it. Uh, apparently, this is according to news reports and according to people who uh, have been leaking information about what was discussed yesterday during the retreat, but according to those reports, the, 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 there are three groups kind of formed in terms of their, their response to these um, reform principles. The first group, so this is Speaker Boehner, Cant, uh, Majority Leader Cantor, uh, you know, Chairman Ryan, uh, Repres Representative Mario diaz Ballard, um, who has been an ardent supporter of immigration reform, uh, a Republican out of uh, Florida, they are all very supportive of these principles, or these standards, should call them, these standards, and they are very supportive of moving the ball forward on immigration reform. Now, when that happens, they're thinking, once the filing deadlines for primaries is over, that they're ready to kind of move forward with immigration reform. Whether that means bringing for, forth the, the bills that passed in the House Judiciary Committee a few months ago, or that, whether that means a new bill, they're ready to move forward. So you have that one group. The second group um, that, that's being developed, or that was, I think, uh, you know, very, very vocal, I should say, yesterday, was those who were just outright against it. So, I mean, again, it's not a surprise. I mean, we've heard from, say, Steve King from uh, Iowa and others who just said, this is not the time for immigration reform, and, um, and we, can't, we can't or we haven't secured our borders yet. It will be very difficult to do so, and moreover, we just don't want to give the president a win. I mean, th that's just the reality. Um, so you have those who support, those who are against, and then you have the third group, which I think sounds like is the majority of the group who were in attendance yesterday at the retreat, which is immigration reform is important, and we know we have to do something. The system is broken, but the timing is bad to do something on this. And, you know, even if, even if we wait for the primary deadlines to be you know over, the timing is still bad. And you know, this is we're going into midterm election. Um, again, we don't want to give the president a win, and we don't, let's be honest, there, there's a lot of folks in that caucus who just don't trust the president of the United States to implement an immigration reform bill. I mean, because once you pass it, you have to go through the whole implementation process, whether that you know, not only involves the White House, but involves, obviously, the relevant federal agencies. So there is a little, real concern about timing. Um, so right now, I think that there's it's a lot of uncertainty in terms of uh, what Speaker Boehner and what the House leadership is going to do next. Uh, I will also say that in terms of the legalization aspect, um, you know, there is no pathway to citizenship for those folks. Now, House Democrats and Senate Democrats may say, all right, we're willing to go along with that for right now in a bill. 
but they may not. They may say, if, you, if there's no special pathway to citizenship, it's a no-go. And we will pay, play politics with this, and we will make you guys look bad on the Republican side. I mean, that's a legitimate outcome. So it is, right now, I think it's, it's, there are several scenarios, uh, and all of it depends on what the House Republican leadership, not House Republican rank and file's reaction is to this bill, and what Speaker Boehner is willing to do. Um, so it, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of balls in the air. Um, I, I think that uh, we also need to take into account the pressure and our, our business colleagues are putting on, on, on their membership, on their delegations. Uh, at the end of the day, you have not only high-tech business, but you have, say, farmers saying, we need immigration reform, Mr. Congressman or Ms. Congresswoman, and we need you to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, I think that they are, and I'll speak for our business colleagues, because we work very closely with them. I think they're willing to give, um, give the House Republican leadership until the summer. Post-filing deadlines, they're willing to give them until the summer to see if anything gets done. Or if there's, a, if there's a, you know, an effort afoot to actually draft legislation or move the existing um, bills in the House. There, if, that, if that's the case, then I think that then the House Republicans would be okay. But if it's not, I think they're going to see, see significant pressure and feel significant pressure from the Chamber of Commerce, from the high-tech industry, from National Association of Manufacturers and others to get something done. Um, again, this has been, in my experience, I say 10, 10 years in the making, and Heather, maybe longer. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time, and our business colleagues have been talking about it for a long time. And I think that there is just an interest in seeing something done. Another important point that I, I think is important to raise, which was included in the standards, is actually in the preamble of the standards, which said, the House will not negotiate with the Senate or, or meet to conference, I should say, with the Senate on the Senate's comprehensive immigration reform bill. So as we all know, last, last summer, the, House, the Senate passed this comprehensive immigration reform bill, supported by Democrats and Republicans alike. Um, you know, actually, some of the you know, four Republicans were senators were very instrumental in developing this comprehensive immigration reform bill that passed. The House leadership has said countless times, and they solidified it in the, the, the document that was released yesterday, under no circumstances will they meet with the Senate to conference on the Senate immigration reform bill. So I don't know how that looks. I mean, you know, typically we have a, a bill that's passed in one of the houses, or both houses. You have, you know, you, this House and Senate meet to conference and work out the differences between the language and figure out, you know, a, a one bill and one common way forward. At this point, the House leadership is saying, there's no way we're even gonna look at the Senate bill. So does that mean that if the House passes a bill or a series of bills, they go to the Senate and say, take it or leave it? Or what does it mean? I mean, it's, that's, that's, the, that's kind of the, the level of uncertainty we're dealing with. Do they say, OK, we're not going to look at your, your comprehensive Senate bill, but we'll take the DREAM Act portion and we'll conference it with maybe the portion that we've developed and go from there. I mean, it's, it's, it's uncertain what they mean. Um, and so right now, at this point, I think there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think the, you know, we have a span of time here, several months, uh, before people start getting really angry, and I mean our business colleagues. And I think the Chamber of Commerce, um, the uh, president of the of chamber, um, Mike, uh, Mr. Donahue, has pretty much said, do it. We've had CEOs from the high-tech companies fly into D.C. on numerous occasions, going to the members of Congress, and Speaker Boehner particularly, do it. Do immigration reform. Um, it's, it's interesting. It'll be interesting whether or not they feel that pressure. So um, that's kind of, I don't, again, the scenarios, there's several scenarios, but right now I think things are very, very, very up in the air. Um, but I think from, from the university standpoint, we're going to, conti going to continue to um, pressure, encourage, uh, our res respective House members to do the right thing and to move immigration reform. And again, also talk to the Senate because again, 
you can't get a lot done if you're not talking to your counterpart. And uh, so we're, we're going to we're going to regroup and <laughs> kind of see where we go from here. But I think that this is going to be continued pressure and um, the principles or the standards are, are what they are, but they're just one step. And hopefully it'll be another step in a better or the right direction. So that's my spiel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Heather. Heather's going to tell you all the substance stuff. Really good stuff. Thank you. I was going to check to see if I could see over the podium earlier, but I didn't. But I can. I can. Good things come in small packages. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. I'm delighted to be here. Amy covered so much ground, and I'm going to go into the nitty-gritty of it. And one thing that Amy was saying that really struck me as indicative of where we are right now, the principles or standards. There's a discussion of whether or not to call it standards or principles. First, they start off with principles. Now they're saying standards. So here we are. Um, that's where the debate is. So there's a lot in here. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in, in the particulars of the bills that could impact international students and to some degree scholars, but I'll focus more on international students. Um, we want to cover some of the basic changes that can occur uh, under either bill. Uh, they will help international students who are looking for employment in the United States. Uh, please don't feel like you have to remember a lot of what I'm talking about or the intricacies in the details because so much will change as discussions move forward. But there are some themes that are running through all of the bills and the discussions around here. So there are a few things that I want to cover, including one, dual intent or non-immigrant intent requirement for foreign students. That is being uh, discussed and it's included in both House and Senate bills. Um, also the focus on STEM, that comes through in the, the non-immigrant intent provision. Then green cards, there's a lot of focus on green cards in both the House and the Senate. And in green cards, there's also a focus on STEM when you're talking about high skilled. Moving forward, optional practical training. A lot of people who are graduating look to find employment using optional practical training. Those provisions are in at least one version of the bill. And finally, the H-1B process. I know that's everybody's favorite. Yes, so there's some changes being proposed there. So let me far first start with non-immigrant intent. You know, a basic tenet of US immigration law is that we believe the rest of the world wants to be an American. Any person who goes to a consulate, they assume you're an intended immigrant. Unless you can prove to the satisfaction of a consular official that you don't have immigrant intent, um, and you're applying for a non-immigrant visa, like an F, an F student, they will not give it to you. So foreign students have to prove that they have no intent to immigrate to the United States. That can be very challenging, especially, especially for very young students. You know, they don't have things to point to that an older person may have. They might, depending on their circumstances, but a spouse, excuse me, in their home country, a home, a business, a job to return to. So it becomes challenging for some students, and especially in some parts of the world, to prove that they have no intent to immigrate. And so this is something we've been discussing quite a bit over a number of years. And Congress has really, really moved forward in their thinking on this. And so the House version of the Immigration Reform Bill, the Skills Visa Act that Amy spoke about, has dual intent for F students that are studying in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, and I'm using the phrase dual intent. Dual intent is a very interesting legal fiction. Um, a number of years ago, you know, a number of years ago, the business community was having a big problem because they were hiring people on H-1Bs and then filing for green cards for them. So they're, they're working in H-1B or maybe L status, intercompany transferee status, and backlogs developed for the green cards. And so people would travel outside the United States, you know, as people do, conferences, see people, whatever, just living your life. They'd have a pending green card. They'd get to the port of entry and the uh, officer would say, oh, hi, welcome back. So I see you're entering on an H-1B. So 
are you intending to, to stay here permanently? Or, oh, I also see you have a pending green card. That, that's a challenge. So you want to enter on an H, and an H has non-immigrant intent. You have a green card pending. That says you have immigrant intent. I'm not letting you back in. And turn them around. Because to come in on the H, you had to have non-immigrant intent. And so that was very bad for the business community over a period of time. So there was some lobbying that was involved a little in. And um, so H-1Bs, L's, intercompany transferees, fiancés, and the spouses and minor children of legal permanent residents who are coming here to join them can have dual intent. And that just means when you show up, you can have either an intent to immigrate or not. Since our immigration system looks at the world and says, you all want to be Americans, we know it, um, <laughs> we've got to put them into a category. They're not non-immigrants, they're not immigrants, they're, they're people living their lives. <laughs> Novel, that's why I call it a legal fiction, because really, we're just all people. Anyway, so um, what we need is for international students also to be recognized as people and be awarded dual intent. Now, this has been a de debate that's gone back and forth, and NAFSA, the Association of International Educators, we, we advocated for dual intent for all students. If you're NAF, dual intent. That caused agita for many people, and um, so the discussion became, where do you draw the line? Like, all students, really? All Fs, really? Well, community colleges, you know, that's a two-year degree, and people don't finish, and is that a real school? Yes. Um, but so the discussion, especially during the last immigration reform debate, was drawing lines. Is it all Fs? Is it BA and higher? Is it master's degree and higher? Is it PhD and higher? Is it one person? No. Um, is it STEM? Is it STEM only? And if so, where does, where does the line go? And so that debate's coming to a forefront. The House, BA and higher, BA and higher STEM. And the Senate, um, all BAs and higher. And so that's, that's a challenge, and we'll see where that will play out. But it, it is very important. You also have the challenge, too, with um, math, uh, people defending their dissertation uh, or people that uh, have U.S. citizen uh, fiancés and or people getting married. If they are up front at the port of entry, you know, just being friendly, how you doing? Why are you coming back? Oh, I'm defending my dissertation and I'm going to have a job after that. No, no, you're not. <laughs> Bye, because that can be seen as an attempt to immigrate. If you have a fiancé, a U.S. citizen fiancé, and you mention that, they can say, ha, huh, so you really like this country, don't you? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't like you. Bye. So dealing with that issue is really important because we, we don't want to close off those opportunities. So the limitation to STEM. Um, STEM is something that's really captured the American mind. Um, there's a lot of talk and a lot of things written about the importance of STEM and how they generate jobs and innovation and all of that. Um, then people look at STEM and go, well, really? Do you mean all STEM degrees? Like, what about these fly-by-night schools that are just going to pop up behind a Dunkin' Donuts that's right around the corner and say, we're giving masters in STEM? We don't, we don't want those. So there's been an effort to determine What's a worthy school? How do you determine a worthy school? So they turn to the Carnegie or Carnegie classifications. I do immigration. I don't know a lot about that. Amy knows a lot more about that than I do. Um, but it has to be, in some instances, not every part of both bills do they limit STEM to the Carnegie levels, but some parts do and some parts don't. But just to know, there's some effort to limit STEM even further. So it would be, and I wrote it down, um, with a very high or high level of research activity as classified by the Carnegie, yes, those are right, or uh, being determined to be equivalent as such by the National Science Foundation. Also, requirement that they have been in existence for 10 years or more and be accredited. So there's STEM. Now, green cards. So both bills are very heavily weighted to green cards. And I like to describe this as the difference between renters and buyers. You know, in this country, we really, we really think people who buy a home in a community are really invested in that community. Um, people are renting 
they're just passing through. They're not as invested. They're not as interested in what the school district is like and services there. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and so that, I think, is how we look at green cards versus non-immigrants. And um, we really, our policies are really switching to making sure more people are on paths to green cards um, and less on non-immigrants. Additionally, there's a view that non-immigrants are more easily exploited by employers and unscrupulous people than green card holders. Because if you're a legal permanent resident, if you're a green card holder, you can work wherever you want. You're not tied to your employer to file the next petition for you. Um, it's not more difficult to get a promotion because that won't, if you get a promotion that could affect your green card or your H-1B, it's easier to switch jobs if you have a green card. So there's uh, a real fear that having so many people in non-immigrant status makes it easier for people to exploit them. Additionally, there's a feeling that um, because it's easier to exploit potentially people in a non-immigrant status, that for unscrupulous employers, it's a um, incentive not to hire a U.S. worker because a U.S. worker, they feel, would be more apt to complain where a non-immigrant would say, you know what, I'm here until I get my green card, my kids get their green cards, I don't want to have to move, my kids are in school, I have a nice house, I'll just wait this out, where a U.S. citizen might not do that. So heavily weighted towards green cards. For international students, there is also a desire to create a direct path to green card for some students. Um, as you likely know, you know, there are not enough green cards available annually each year. There are only 140,000 green cards available annually for employment-based immigration. 140,000 for the entire country. And then it's broken up in various different ways. There are caps on per countries. Only so many can be issued to people from certain countries. So if you're from Iceland, easy. If you're from India, not so much. You know, India, China, and on the family side, Philippines and Mexico, they wait decades, sometimes longer than decades, than multiple decades, to get green cards, especially on the family side. Um, so there's a desire to, and both bills would eliminate the per country caps. And then there's preference levels, and it's really, it's really confusing. So creating a direct path to green card for some students will be great. Then, you know, it's because there's not enough green cards, is that more of a heavily, H-1B is more heavily relied upon. Sometimes they sit there waiting until their green card comes available. There are not enough H-1Bs available. There are 65,000 every year. Those often disappear first, second, third day. First day of filing is April 1st, which is kind of funny given what we celebrate on April 1st. But um, <laughs> high demand disappear quickly. There are 20,000 set aside for master's degree and higher graduates from U.S. institutions right now. That may change. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so there are not enough H-1Bs, so then there's a reliance on OPT. So it, all, it just all goes down. So if you fix the, the green card program, there is some help there. Um, the, the Senate bill exempts doctoral degree students, all of them, from the green card cap. That's the Senate bill. It also exempts foreign students with a master's degree or higher in STEM with a job offer in a related field from their studies um, if they get that job within five years of graduation. So STEM, uh, Senate, PhD, green card, direct path. Um, master's degree and higher, STEM, job within five years of uh, your graduation has to be in the field that you study. Um, so uh, that would be a wonderful, a wonderful thing. It would exclude them from having to do the H-1B route and uh, more direct, wonderful. Um, the House bill is different. It exempts PhD students from the green card cap while c it continues to require that an employer petition for them. That's not so bad. You know, they have to look for a job, PhD. That's good. Um, but the schools that they graduate from have to meet the criteria that I spoke of earlier. It's STEM, and it has to be the Carnegie classification, 10 years in existence, and be accredited. So that's a, a bit less there. 
Um, they, these students would also have to study in the United States 85% of the time. And this is an interesting part, I think, because there's a recognition that there's an expanding area of uh, multi-country study. I'm not saying that correctly, but like dual degree programs or a semester abroad. Or, um, and I hear from a growing number of business schools that they will have a cohort of students that they, they're in the US for a semester or a time, and then maybe they go to India, maybe they go to China, come back to the US, go to a fourth country. But they, it's, a, it's a very innovative way of educating someone. And you think about it, if we want people to stay in the United States upon graduation, and you have somebody who has their home country experience, in the US experience, a third country experience, maybe a fourth country experience, that person has a lot of good knowledge. Um, so but the idea was we want to make sure that we're giving this benefit, a more direct path to green card, to people who study in the United States. They want to make sure. Originally, the bill said 100% of the time. And there was some no negotiations there, some talk about what this would mean, because that would mean no foreign student could go on a study abroad program. So they moved it to 85%. Still, it doesn't count for an entire semester, but it's better than no study whatsoever. Um, so they, the, both bills do things to try to make more green cards available overall. Sorry, this is mundane stuff. I, I'm sorry if this is boring. Um, but they no longer count spouses against the cap. That's important because half of the numbers go to spouses and children, a little bit more than half. So that frees up more than half the numbers. They limit, eliminate the per-country limits, so that's great. Um, and both allow for some increases in the, per, uh, in the priority levels on the upper end. So your outstanding researchers and professors and you know, multi, your managers that are pretty high up. Um, only the Senate bill recaptures unused green cards from prior years. That's an important thing because every year with the allocation, um, how those are allocated dependent upon how, how quickly DHS works. And they're not known to be speedy. So in some years, some green cards have gone unallocated. And uh, in prior legislation, they've gone back and recaptured them from prior years and then re reallocated them in future years. And so that would be great. It's over 100,000, I think, that, that would be re recaptured. And that would help get rid of the green card backlog. So that's in the Senate bill. It's not in the House bill. In the past, the House has been supportive of that. It could come up. But overall, it's about instead of raising the green card cap, because that's, that's really touchy for a lot of people, it's about exemptions, carve outs, direct path to green card, that sort of thing. So that's what you'll be hearing about more. So next issue, OPT. Now, optional practical training. Um, graduates have one year of OPT upon graduation. Um, and STEM graduates in certain classifications, certain majors get 29 months. And I'm simplifying it because there could be some limitations on the amount of time, depending on whether or not you did OPT while you're, while you're studying. Um, but the genesis of OPT was optional practical training. And the way many view it from the school perspective is that it helps the competitiveness of US schools. Because not only can you come here and study and get world-class education, you have a period of time upon graduation where you can work and see how things are done. You get that experience here as well, practical training. Well, employers hiring people, for them, they're employers. And for people, uh, employers, no, they're employees. The employer is hiring employees, sorry. Um, and uh, for many on the Hill, they look at them and go, wow, they're employees. Huh, it's open-ended EAD. They can work for any employer. It's supposed to be tied to what they're studying. Um, and. It doesn't have the same wage requirements or filings that the H-1B does. And that's of a concern for some. First, they're concerned about the wage rate, but really it's the exploitation, the potential of exploitation. What was said to me by a staffer is, well, what we're really concerned about is that an employer could, not like I have a story or this horrible thing happened, could hire a STEM OPT student, have them work for 29 months, treat them poorly, pay them very little, and then at the end of 20 month, 29 months, say goodbye and do it over and over again with successive OPT students. Um, we are not for that. Uh, I don't think anybody that's scrupulous is for that. Um, but the House bill, what they do is they say, 
for OPT students, an employer would have to prove that they're paying basically an H-1B wage. Um, it doesn't say how they would do that. It doesn't say in the bill, so you will file like you would for an H-1B, but it has the same language in the higher of the prevailing or actual wage, but it's really to get at the wage. The concern there is that especially if an employer is hiring someone for one year, that's a, signific a significant barrier for an employer who doesn't already hire immigrants. If someone, if an employer is coming to this fresh, that is a disincentive, especially for the one year. That's not a long period of time. People joke, you know, it takes six months to understand the phone system. Not that people use phones anymore, but, um, <laughs> but you know, a year's not a long period of time. For the 29 months, there is I mean, I've been proposing, other people have been talking about, if you really want to get at the 29-month period, why not treat that category differently? If someone is working for one year, fine. Working for 29 months, let's talk. If you feel like there needs to be something done for that, maybe, let's talk. Um, but they're viewing it as employment, and so that is something that may come up. The H-1B, switching to everybody's favorite topic. So right now, 65,000 are available annually, 20,000 set aside for master's, and, uh, master's degree and higher, any major. Uh, the Senate bill would increase it by 5,000, but limit it to STEM. The House bill would increase it to 40,000, but limit it to STEM. I was on maternity leave when this was discussed. And I, I came back and I was like, what, what happened here? And I guess people, yeah, people, people were saying, well, the alternative was no carve out. No set aside. I'm like, okay, that's great. Loving the carve out. Thank you. Sam, it is then. Um, so you have, you have that change. On the positive side, that's positive too, sorry. Another positive thing, spousal employment for H-1Bs. That's great. Um, the Senate bill would increase the cap to 110000 with an escalator. So if there was more demand, it could escalate to a, a ceiling. The House, 150000 no escalator. So let's talk about doing that. Um, so, it's all complicated. Um, on H-1B, there's a wage issue that I won't go into very much. It's, you know, now there are four wage rates. They want to switch to three. They want to bump it up. And um, it's really, really complicated. I don't enjoy it. Any, nobody really enjoys it. But that will be challenging for hiring H-1Bs, understanding where they fit in the continuum. DREAM Act. Yay! It used to be something that was quite controversial. Now it's far less so, allowing students who were raised, people who were raised in the United States, to have access to legalization and uh, become citizens, citizens. Wonderful. The Senate version of the bill is better than any other version of the bill that's ever I've ever seen. It's been kicked around for more than 10 years, Senator Durbin was the biggest advocate for it. Um, and uh, the, the age has shifted from 15 to 16 to 16 to 15. Um, and I believe that one's 15. Also, there have been caps on the age. How old can you be and still say you're a dreamer? Um, people who, <laughs> right, people who started this debate 10 years ago or 15 years ago before there was even a bill, they would be dreamers. They were like, I need, I need, my brother needs it. We all need this. For many bills, they've aged out. They're 30, they're 35. Um, and so the Senate bill actually says there's no cap on the age. If you came here as a child under the, the stated age, I don't care how old you are now, we, we, still, we still want you. We still recognize you. So anyway, I went on and on, but we'll see what happens with the bill. But there are some running themes. And uh, I wish us all luck. Thank you. <laughs> I think you covered a tremendous amount of landscape. I don't know about you, but my head is spinning with all this information. But let, let's spend some time on some questions from the audience that can be directed to either Amy or Heather or both. And um, there's, okay, you paid me $5, you can go first, okay? <laughs> she's she's well, coming with the microphone. The microphone's coming down. Thank you. Do DREAMers have to apply for OPT right now, or what is their employment situation for DREAMers currently before the bill hopefully will be passed? I don't know if my voice doesn't travel well, and I get a bit of a yeah. 
a head thing going on right today. Um, so for DREAMers, right now there's the deferred action for childhood arrivals. And that's what DREAMers are mostly using now. That's an administrative process that the Obama administration put in place where people who basically fit the requirements of the DREAM Act you know, entered, uh, I forget the age number, but very 15, 16 or something like that, um, and can prove that they were in the United States for a stated period of time. Many people are using uh, school records or even tweets, I've heard people say that, um, to prove that they've been in the country for uh, an appropriate amount of time. Um, with that, they get employment authorization. And it's deferred action, which is saying, you know what, we recognize you're in the country without authorization, but we're going to defer any action against you. And since we're saying you can stay here, we're going to give you work authorization because yes. you need to live. Um, and it's coming up to the two-year mark for that uh, not-too-distant future. Um, and uh, people will have to, they'll have to figure out what to do. So until the DREAM Act comes into effect, DACA is the way that people are going. Okay. And that's the DACA status, right? That they have to apply for? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. It's a filing. Yeah, and I think there's a fee attached to it. And, and that allows them to do many things. Some states dodge about whether or not they can get a driver's license, but schools, employment, all that opens up for them. Okay. Oh, I have, I forgot I was mic'd. Yes, you're mic'd. I totally forgot. <laughs> Hi, I'm not gonna stand because I'll be right in front of everyone. My name's Rachel Johnson, I'm from Drexel University. Um, our school's a little bit unique. We're a handful of schools that have a co-op program. Um, and so one of the requirements for students if they're in our five-year program is that they have to do three six-month co-ops. So 18 months of CPT. Um, and I know it's not something that was touched on, but I'm curious, and I was actually talking to someone at lunch about this, if there was anything in the new standards about possibly raising the CPT cap of 364 days without impacting OPT. Um, I, I assume you know what I'm referring to. Okay. Um, because the idea is let's keep these students here, let's get these highly skilled students in our workforce, and then if they do these requirements for their program, they can't stay for that OPT. So was there anything included in the new standards about that? or Nothing, nothing no, in the standards. Not in the standards, no. And not right. in the bills either. There is a disconnect in the understanding about how higher education has evolved. When you look at Capitol Hill, it's, it's interesting. There's a huge age gap. Like most members of Congress are, are a bit older. Mm -hmm. Most staffers are very young. Um, and sometimes I think, well, the younger people in the offices might go, you know what? I did this, or my friend did this, or that's, this doesn't work for current the current situation. But that doesn't happen as much as it should. People. Staffers understand study abroad. There's not a lot of understanding of a co-op program. People don't know what CPT yeah. is. They don't know what OPT is. They don't. The they students don't even, don't even know. <laughs> well, well, they don't know the difference between a J student and an F student. So I really feel like um, the higher ed community uh, needs to better explain, especially to their members of Congress, about how you are educating students and what, how the immigration system impacts that. I often talk to staffers. Like, why are you here? Why do you care about yeah. immigration and foreign students? But yeah, I'll, I'll take that a step further. I mean, yeah. I think there's a lack of understanding about not only the, you know, the way we educate students. I mean, education is very global. I mean, again, as Heather just mentioned earlier, you know, you may go from you know four different countries and have experiences which help not only you in your long-term goals, but we, if you do come back to the United States or you you know, come back to your a U.S. campus, you are not only, you're enriching the campus and the people you have contact with on that campus because of your international experiences. Um, and I think members of Congress and to a certain extent some staff are taking a very, very narrow view of international education or education in general, but immigration reform is in particular. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> it's something that I note that shows up frequently in this legislation is um, that your employment has to be tied to your field of study. So what we're finding at institutions where we have very strong liberal arts programs is the 
students are making choices based on you know, what their employment is going to look like. And for us, it's a challenge, because where does that leave your history major? Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious to know, you know if at the higher levels there's any consideration of the American liberal arts education being one of the country's best exports to India and China, uh, but then when the students get here, they, because of this law, are really getting funneled towards the more pre-professional um, I will say that if my boss, the Hunter Rawlings, who's the president of the AAU, uh, were here, he would love that question because uh, AAU represents research-intensive universities. So obviously, people think we talk about STEM all the time. No, we talk about the comprehensive university, and we talk about the importance of the liberal arts education, the languages, and history, and so forth. And frankly, I think that there is um, a lack of, again, a lack of understanding about the the importance of the liberal arts education to the overall education the student receives on the Hill. And so the, as, at the end of the day, I think STEM is something that people have been talking about for so long, that's all they think about is STEM. And I go, and I, I, I always refer to a um, hearing that took place, I want to say back in 2011, um, uh, at the time, uh, Lamar uh, Smith, who is, uh, was chair of the uh, Judiciary Committee, and he was talking about STEM, and he thought about STEM in, this, in the form of computer science, um, statistics, and maybe one other discipline. I mean, he at that point had a very narrow view of STEM itself. So he wasn't even thinking about language and history and so forth. And it's really unfortunate to me. So I think it is in incumbent upon us to continue to talk about the fact that other universities around the globe are trying to model themselves after un US universities. And it's because of the liberal arts aspect, not just the science and STEM aspect. I, and I think a lot of the discussion is, has focused around innovation and job creation. Like mm -hmm. How can they tie it to that? And people like to say, oh, that's the STEM degrees. And yeah. I've started to say, you know, you may need STEM, but you need the flower as well. You know? <laughs> it's rather great. Aww. That's the kind of gal I am. Um, but also, another, another thing that I, I'll say is that I talked with uh, someone from Google, and I said, isn't it true that you need to hire people outside of STEM degrees because increasingly you're focusing on the user experience? I have no STEM background whatsoever. Poli sci, English, philosophy. Mm. Um, and I need to be able to, I expect to pick up an iPhone and the newest gadget thing and be able to use it. So don't you need people to be able to translate that? People who understand people? Um, and she said, absolutely. You know, we look for people that have a worldwide experience. We look for diversity. We're higher all over. We're not just looking for STEM. Um, and not to name drop or anything, but I was, I was at a meeting with some White House officials, and um, I, I said that, um, you know, it's very frustrating all this focus on STEM. You know, that that's not the entire U.S. education. And uh, one of the people said to me, "Well, do you have examples of?" liberal arts majors who have gone on to do great things. Tons. <laughs> Tons. <laughs> so, yes. right, I am Peg. Uh, no. uh, so my email address is Heather S at NAFSA, N-A-F as in Frank, S as in Sam, A dot org. Um, and so I'm looking for stories um, about liberal arts majors who have either made a great impact in the U.S. or abroad, and to build that. So President Obama went to our institution. I'm from Columbia. Mm -hmm. So maybe those White House officials could connect with him. He is the product of a foreign student okay, experience. Let's go back to more questions. <laughs> <laughs> and I suspect Sorry. many of you wrote down that stem flower type of yes. um, connection. Okay, okay. That's a good one. I will be using it. Probably about two more questions, and I'm going to ask after those two questions, both of you, where do you think we'll be 12 months from now, 18 months from now on the topics you talked about? But it's more, two more questions. Thank you. I'm uh, Jill McLaughlin from John Carroll University. We have a very slow growth of international students um, and a lot of exchange students, mm -hmm. and this might come up in our next session, but how does, um, with internships, it impact either an exchange student who wants to do an internship, maybe stay longer, right? Or a f degree student who is, um, on the other end, finished their OPT as now an alum and has kind of lapsed their time. 
on the on those two experiences. Kind of a dual question there. Um, for exchange visitors, J, if if that's what you're speaking of, there are completely different rules for J's, and uh, the bills only speak to J for physicians. Um, that that's really what the bills are right now. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure if there are other things in play for J's, um, and for students who finish OPT, um, that it the bills really contemplate that they would be on some other path like um, you know to H1B or or something like that um, no talk about any any other relief for them one final burning question yes while, while Congress sorry while Congress stagnates <laughs> what what can states do, and what are states doing? What rights do they have and choices? Well, I mean, I, I think in terms of Dream, I mean, I think we see we've seen a lot of. Um, I know we're talking about international students, but you know, in terms of Dream, I know that they've done a lot. So, like I want to say, eighteen or maybe twenty states have uh, Dream Act provisions, so students, for example, can get in-state tuition and fellowships and so forth. So, I mean, the states are doing some things in in that regard. Um, in terms of immigration, I mean, obviously, I think the broader picture, they're not doing too much. At least I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Yeah, the big thing is trust acts right now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, speaking to what um, police can do, peace officers can, can do, what they can ask. Uh, instead of going the route of a few years ago where Arizona passed a very punitive sort of bill in Alabama as well, mm -hmm. uh, there's a turn to um, saying people should be feel feel free to call the police and not be afraid that they might get turned over to immigration if they're an undocumented status. If somebody is stopped by the police for speeding or broken taillight or something like that, can they or can they not ask them for proof that they're in the country in a documented status? Also, whether or not the state um, works with ICE and how closely they do. Um, yeah, that's really I, my opinion where states are going. And now you see. Uh, states also having programs like Global Michigan or Global Detroit or I can't think of any other states right now, but there are a bunch of states that are looking at ways to become hubs for international talent, to attract them there, to grow their businesses and have innovation and build up their downtowns a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, Heather, Amy, um, you both have a, a wealth of knowledge, okay? And where do you, you personally think will be 12 months from now, 24 months from now, what would you like to have occur in the topics you've talked about? This is a non-recorded type of that, um, presentation. Okay, that's good, okay. thank you. Uh, if, if I'm being optimistic, I would like to say 12 months from now that um, the House has passed um, either, well, the House has passed a few targeted immigration reform bills and that they are actually talking and willing to, to conference in some way with the Senate. If I'm being an optimist, I'm saying that. If I'm being a pessimist, I'm saying nothing happens and that Speaker Boehner uh, feels, like he, he feels like he can only take his caucus, but so far. Um, you know, I think that even though he put out the principles yesterday, he's already taken a step back from them saying, yo, well, wait, wait a second, I know you're upset, I know you're concerned about timing, so don't worry, nothing's gonna happen tomorrow. Um, I, you know, I think that right now he is, is a really tenuous situation because he's he still has, uh, you know, a good 40 to 60 members of his caucus who are Tea Partyers, and they're they're really hold, still holding a speech to the fire. So he's still trying to manage that relationship. So if I'm a pessimist, I say nothing happens, and uh, we're talking about this um, in 2017. Okay. Because we're not going to talk about it in 2016. I mean, for the election, I just don't see it. Okay. Heather, what's your optimistic view? My optimistic view. <laughs> well, I think. In the next 12 to 18 months, one thing that, that has to happen, and I believe people are doing it more, is educating their member of Congress about how immigration impacts them personally, professionally, their communities, so they better understand exactly what they're facing. The, the anti-immigrant side um, is very vocal, and they're very clear mm -hmm. with what they want. And, the pro-immigration side, especially outside just the family groups, 
are less clear and less unified about what they want. So I believe in the coming months, people will continue to say why it's important. Um, and I think, uh, I, I hope that we can move forward and understand that this, that the bill that passes is not the last yeah. bite at the apple, as they say. It's not going to be a great bill, no mm -hmm. matter what passes. It's not going to be a great mm -hmm. bill. But it's not written in stone. We, as Americans, go towards um, righting wrongs. It can take us a while. But once you are shown an injustice, we want to fix it. And so I think, I think a bill will pass. It will be very imperfect. And then we'll, we will be able to go back and fix the parts that need to be fixed, add parts that need to add, and then we can focus on fixing the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's what I think. I think we have been very fortunate to have you both yeah. here. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're gonna break for about 15 minutes, and let's say we'll get back here at on 10 of the hour. Does that sound fine? Thank you all. <laughs>